here is Mick West. And this, this is, I've known of Mick for a, quite a while. Um, back in um, Skeptical and some of the other conferences we've gone to in Tam, I believe. Um, you know, he kind of stands out with that British accent. He's tall, good looking guy, and you know, he's smart. And, and I kind of notice him. But um, Mix is really coming up there in the world, and we're really, really, I've just been very impressed with him. The work he does, I know he's been doing this stuff for a long time, but you know, I'm just very impressed. Um, he has a book for sale, Holly, his wife back here, wave your hands. He's got some books, I think they're $20, and they're oh, she does that really well with like that. Like a professional. And um, you can also find Nick on Wikipedia as well as websites that um, he may or may not be mentioning. But uh, we recently wrote his Wikipedia page and I'm super proud of it. It's a really terrific page and we'll learn a lot about him. Um, when I asked him to come here, he's from Upper Sacramento, so he drove quite a ways to come down here to talk to us today. And so I'm very honored that he came here. And um, I asked him, I know you're going to talk about conspiracy theories, and several people have mentioned things today um, about conspiracy theories that are going to lead into this talk. And I loved his book, by the way. And he said he would do something to kind of keep it California-ish, and he's going to talk about wildfire conspiracy theories. city of paradise and some other communities around 
uh, paradise were completely destroyed. 95% wiped off from that. It's quite an extraordinary event. And this was such an extraordinary event that it kind of prompted some things in people. Whenever there's an extraordinary event like uh, an assassination uh, of a significant figure like JFK, or a large event like 9-11, uh, or any kind of uh, mass casualty event like the shootings in Las Vegas, people uh, seek out extraordinary explanations. Uh, the official story doesn't seem extraordinary enough. The official story of these fires is just that uh, it was dry weather, we had a drought, it was very windy, uh, people built their houses too close to the forest, and you know, that's, that just seems boring to most people. It doesn't, what it lacks for most people is an agency. When people see significant events, they like to think that someone is behind it. Uh, and just nature isn't good enough. So they gravitate towards a human-based conspiracy theory. And in this case, uh, the conspiracy theory around the forest fires, around the wildfires, is one called directed energy weapons. Yes. Uh, directed energy weapons, the theory essentially is that a weapon like a, a laser or a microwave beam mounted possibly on a plane, like you see here, or uh, possibly on a satellite, mm -hmm. is being used to start these forest fires, and specifically to target houses, uh, for reasons we'll get into later. Uh, this is a real plane, by the way, this is an actual uh, US Air Force plane, and it's a real uh, laser that they have mounted on the nose there. And it is actually capable of uh, starting fires. Uh, so it is technologically possible that there maybe could actually be flying planes over, but it's like lighting people's houses on fires. But uh, what evidence is there of this? Is there any evidence at all? If you ask a conspiracy theorist, they will tell you that there's loads of evidence. And I'm going to go through some of this evidence here. And uh, but before I do that though, I should point out that, as a previous speaker noted, that you really don't want to be just simply presenting the evidence for a conspiracy theory. Uh, because if you just give people lots and lots of evidence, they tend to actually go along with the first thing that they heard, and they, they'll, uh, you, you kind of go the wrong way. But since you're all good, good skeptics here, I'm going to start out with the actual evidence for the conspiracy theory, and uh, hopefully you won't all get infected with it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, number one, unburnt trees next to burnt buildings to weapons uh, starting fires. And if you search the theory, you'll see lots and lots of photos just like that. Uh, vaporized trees. This is a, basically, it's uh, a tree that has burnt so completely that even the roots have been burnt down. And uh, yeah, the ground around it is still kind of, you know, just got leaves and green stuff around it. So this was actually, some, this, this was a real hole in the ground uh, in the campfires in paradise, this particular hole. So, you know, why is this tree burnt down to the ground? Why is stuff around it not burnt? Yeah, apparently so. They decided this tree was not worth living. So the, uh, the tree, the Illuminati have some strange criteria. Now this is very interesting, this is a tree that burned from the inside wow. and uh, this was also a real thing during, I think, the Tubbs fire in the Sonoma County uh, and this was a tree that was burning from the inside out and the conspiracy theorist asks uh, what cooks things from the inside out? Microwaves. So obviously this oh. tree was targeted with uh, microwave technology. Here is uh, two fields. The field on the uh, left has not burnt, the field on the right has burnt. They ask why does it choose one field over the other? You can probably figure it out, but they can't. <laughs> uh, this was a street in uh, one of the fires. You can see here this uh, garbage cans over here, and this is a plastic type mailbox here. The garbage cans are just fine, even though they've been knocked over, but the house behind is completely burnt down to the ground. The house on this side of the the road will also be completely burnt down to the ground, uh, but the trees are fine and the plastic gathering cans are fine. So again, the question is why is the forest fire swept through this neighborhood and only burnt down the trees? Huh. That's the answer. 
uh, this map here, the map on the left, here showing where the fires were, map on the right showing where the high speed rail is. There you can see why they match. If you don't to the uh, this, this is very fun. There's actually several different versions of this map with different fire maps and different high speed rail maps. It's a very common explanation. So, uh, as have these lasers from space been clearing uh, houses out of the way so we can build rail roads? Well. That could be the theory. But that brings us to the next question, uh, which is what's behind this conspiracy theory? Why are people why are people seeking out these types of explanations? Well, uh, this theory comes from older conspiracy theories. It's it's not even though it's a new thing and that it's you know a new thing about uh, the forest fires, it's it's seated in older conspiracy theories. They basically uh, think that the government wants to take away their property. They think that these fires are being set so that uh, people, the government, can swoop in and take these houses. The town of Paradise apparently was in the wrong location, so they think the government had it all burned down so they wouldn't rebuild there, so that the government can take that land and use it for, for some other purpose. It's also deeply related to anti-environmentalism. Uh, there's a, quite a long history of anti-environmentalism in uh, America, where people think that people who are pro-environment or pro-sustainability are communists or some other kind of uh, you know, uh, unpatriotic type people. Uh, they see uh, environmentalism as a kind of a misguided ideology or some kind of conspiracy by the, the New World Order. Uh, which is you know, the, over, the general term, the overarching conspiracy of the Illuminati or whoever who are uh, trying to take over the world. Uh, it's commonly linked to the United Nations Agenda 21. This is something you'll see coming up again and again. This is a, a conspiracy theory that's been around for a very, very long time. It's been brought up uh, many, many times over the years by uh, conspiracy theorists and by politicians. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. And there's also some links to 9-11 conspiracy theories, uh, which we will also get into. All right, so what does, the, what does the United Nations have to do with it? If you do a, a Google image search for uh, Jew, which is the, uh, the term they use for directed energy weapons, which also conveniently sounds a little bit like Jew. Uh, <laughs> Jew fire the United Nations, I did a search for that, and you get these, these type of things here, you get the, uh, the uh, burnt houses and burnt trees, you get melted cars, and you also get these maps. And you get a lot of these, you get a lot of, uh, a lot of maps like this, and this one in particular, which you see in a couple of, a couple of ways here, is really uh, an indication of this, like, a root cause of the conspiracy theory, this particular map. The map is titled uh, Simulated Reserve and Corridor System to Protect Biodiversity. And uh, it's being passed around as if it is a United Nations uh, map. The, the red areas on the map are areas that are supposed to be uh, little or no human use. Basically, they're areas that we observe for wildlife. They're connected by these corridors, which also take up a huge amount of land, and the yellow land. Uh, is supposed to be nearly entirely uh, animals and no humans, and we are supposed to live in the blue areas. Uh, you might not be able to see the blue areas, but there's a few little ones just kind of scattered around here and there. And then there's some black dots, which are the cities. So this is this is basically the master plot of the wildfire conspiracy theory. This is what they're trying to do. So you can imagine that they get the beams in space, and they're going to like zap all the people who live in the red areas and the yellow areas force them to live in the blue areas, and then they'll turn the rest of the country into a wildlife reserve for some reason. It's not <laughs> uh, So where did this map come from? Uh, to understand where this map came from, you, came from, you have to have a look at the history of the anti-environmentalist movement, which is essentially a, a history of the anti-federal government environmentalist movement. And it has roots dating back to uh, the turn of the uh, 20th century, so the late 1800s, early 1900s, with the establishment of the National Park Service and the National Forest Service, and later the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, in 1910, there was a huge uh, wildfire called the Big Burn, and this really established the, 
National Forest Service as an actual active federal agency, and it really pissed off people who lived in these national forests, especially in places like California and Montana, where there was more of a, a frontier attitude. They had these uh, young uh, foresters coming in, who just graduated out of Yale, telling them what to do with their trees. So there was you know, some simmering resentment that went on for a long time after that. But really, nothing much really happened with this anti-environmentalism stuff, nothing significant, until uh, around uh, 1970, when Nixon established the EPA, uh, which of course started to put lots of restrictions upon industry and people who wanted to exploit the environment, like loggers and miners and, uh, and yeah, industry like that. In uh, 1973, we had the Endangered Species Act, uh, which placed even more restrictions on. You're probably familiar with things like the, uh, the Delta smelt, uh, which is a small fish that lives in the Sacramento Delta. Oh. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about uh, you know, whether we should save the Delta smelt or we should give water to farmers. You know, that's the type of thing that the Endangered Species Act uh, is responsible for. And it's you know, still a lot of contention today. Uh, 1976 was an interesting year, end of homesteading. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, homesteading actually went on until uh, the middle of the 20th century. You could get 160 acres of land uh, for a filing fee of $18, and if you went and farmed it for five years, then you got to keep that uh, oh. 160 acres of land. It kind of petered out, it was mostly in Alaska and places like that at the end, but it ended in 1976. And 1976 was also uh, the year of what's called the Sagebrush Rebellion. And this was uh, a collection of uh, organizations largely in the West who were very concerned about uh, uh, the influence of the federal government on land. And they basically, they rebelled against this and they started being politically active uh, and uh, trying to uh, get reverted back to state rights so that people could start logging out now. This changed in 1988 into what's called the Wise Use Movement, which was kind of a grassroots movement, but also a lot of industry uh, started getting involved in this, and lots of lobbying, and uh, what's called uh, astroturfing, which is where a corporation starts a fake grassroots movement in order to further their goals. Uh, it's very difficult to tell which is the real movement and which are the which, which other astroturf movements. Then we jump to 1992, uh, in Rio, there was the Earth Summit, and they produced something called the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity was uh, ratified by all of the countries in the world, just about, but not by the United States. Uh, the opposition to this Convention on Biological Diversity was organized by the Wise Use Organization, which evolved from these other things. And this map was shown on the Senate floor and used to uh, galvanize opposition to the 1982 Commission on Biological Diversity. So, they didn't really answer where the map came from. Where did the map come from? It was presented on the Senate floor by a senator from Texas. She was given it by Bob Voigt of the Maine Conservative Rights Institute. And he got it from Michael Kaufman, from an organization called Sovereignty International Inc. And this was based on an extreme interpretation of a 1992 article in a magazine called uh, The Wildland Project, uh, which was briefly mentioned in the Convention on Biological Diversity. So what we have is essentially a conspiracy theory. This map itself is a very old conspiracy theory about the government trying to take over uh, the wildlands. And it dates back to 1992. Wow. And, uh, uh, and this is a direct line between this 1992 map, which was, comes from all this stuff in 1992, and the forest fire conspiracy theories of today. There's some uh, related stuff, which is the Agenda 21 conspiracy theories, which is the same type of thing, but it's all about sustainability rather than uh, uh, the environment. The Dr. Kaufman, the guy who invented the, this map, was a, uh, a libertarian and a forest scientist, and he worked in the paper industry uh, as a forest uh, scientist. But he left what he, uh, what he to pursue what he called a Judeo-Christian approach to convers conversation, uh, conservation, which is essentially a free market approach. Uh, his death was covered, as you see here, by InfoWars, which is a very popular 
conspiracy theory site, as you know. Uh, which takes us to 9-11. What do the, what does the new conspiracy theory have to do with 9-11? Well, uh, we've got conspiracy theorists here. These people who believe in this, this forest fire uh, due weapons are conspiracy theorists. And they think it's a government plot. Uh, because they're a conspiracy theory, people have noted that you know, if you believe in one conspiracy theory, you generally believe in other conspiracy theories that are similar or less extreme than that, that particular conspiracy theory. So they're all going to believe in 9-11 being some kind of government plot. And uh, some of them are going to think that the World Trade Center towers were destroyed by directed energy weapons because of this book, Where Did the Towers Go? Uh, evidence so sort of directed free energy technology on 9-11 by Judy Wood. This was a, a book that a segment of the 9-11 conspiracy theorists believe in. They think that the uh, World Trade Center itself was actually destroyed by energy being from space because they can't understand why it exploded in the way it did. And they have produced, this is like 10 years ago, they produced uh, evidence like this where they will show very similar things to what we saw before. You see a burning car, you see some paper next to it which is not burnt. They can't understand why the car is burning but the paper is not burning. So it's 100% proof of directed energy weapons. <laughs> All right, so uh, to summarize, the, uh, the conspiracy. Uh, I tried to put it all into one uh, sentence, which ended up being kind of long, but it's uh, <laughs> an extreme anti environmentalism conspiracy theory inspired by extreme 9 11 conspiracy theories about property rights and new world order enslavement plots based partly on a false map created possibly indirectly by energy companies lobbying to stop the ratification of the Convention on Biological Diversity because it is thought to be a pantheistic and or communistic plot because of some article on wildlife corridors that almost nobody wrote. <laughs> and it is all compounded by a significant misunderstanding uh, of the science of fire, which is something I'm going to get into in a little bit. Uh, how can we help? Uh, you might ask, why bother? Why bother helping with these silly theories? Well, for a start, it might uh, be someone who's a friend of yours who is sucked into these theories. It might be a relative. It could be a parent, or a sibling, or uh, even a spouse, or even your children. So anyone can get sucked in. So I think you know, you, it's good to be able to help, and you can't, uh, you can't just laugh off people that you live with. Well, you can. <laughs> Married to them, you might know what to do. Uh, and at a broader level, I think uh, beliefs like these cause harm. Uh, these people vote, and some of them are activists. And as you, as you saw, this was based on a conspiracy theory that actually affected Senate legislation. It affected the ratification of the Convention on Biodiversity, which has had an actual effect on conservation uh, efforts in this country. So, conspiracy theories do actually have an effect. So, yeah, it's, I think it's important to address them uh, for a variety of reasons. And because of this, I wrote a book. Uh, I do a lot of debunking online, and I eventually got around to writing a book about the things uh, that I was talking about online. Uh, it's called Escaping the Rabbit Hole, and it contains a three step process maintaining effective dialogue, supplying useful information, and something else that we mentioned today giving it time. Uh, effective dialogue starts with uh, understanding what they think and why they think it, and hopefully I've given you a bit of an overview as to why uh, they, they believe these particular theories here. But it, it varies a lot by individuals, so you've really got to talk to your friend or your relative and figure out why they believe what they do and what exactly they believe and what evidence they think is behind it. You have to, uh, you have to also validate their real concerns. People do have genuine concerns. Uh, the overreach of government, the overreach of federal governments, the conflict between states and federal, is, these are very real debatable issues. Appropriate land use uh, for industry or conservation is also you know, uh, of the debate. And so don't make them feel like their concerns are being dismissed. You've got to actually, uh, don't, just because you're opposing their theory, it doesn't mean that you dismiss everything that they, they say. Uh, avoid backfire, this is something I talk about a lot in the book. You need to keep it polite and constructive and try not to belittle or insult them. Uh, the supplying useful information is showing them mistakes that they have made, uh, show them things they may have missed, give them useful context, 
and show, don't tell, don't just, you know, don't just tell them that they are wrong, show them why they are wrong. There's no uh, one-size-fits-all approach, you have to tell it to do the individual. Alright, let's get to the useful information. Uh, number one, unburned trees do not burn because they are live trees, they're green trees. If a tree, uh, if you cut down a piece of tree, which I did here, this is an experiment I did, and you stick it on fire, and you have a piece of uh, two by four which is dry, and you can stick it on fire, this one will not burn, this one will burn. Uh, you can also show them all three examples of the same thing. This is California in 2017, the uh, Hubs Bar, I think. And this is 1983 in Australia. This was, uh, I think, called Ash Wednesday Fire. And they look oh. exactly the same, except for being black and white versus uh, color. Uh, 1961, there was a huge fire in Bel Air in uh, Los Angeles. And this is uh, actually Zaza Gabor's house, which has burnt entirely to the ground. And it's surrounded completely by green trees. Oh, yeah, what about toilets? Oh, no. Uh, this is 1995, Bowling Green in Virginia. Oh. Virginia. This is the other Bowling Green. Oh, several bowling greens. And the same type of thing as it goes on here, you find isolated houses that burn, that one didn't. There's trees just fine over here, there's fields that haven't burned. Well, the same type of thing. 1910, Wallace. Uh, Wallace, Idaho. This was the big burn. Uh, you can see that the hillside still, this actually hillside did not burn. This, all these houses did burn. It's like a little hard to see here. But here we have uh, a wooden sidewalk uh, which did not burn, and yet the, the house inside burned. So, wow. obviously, laser beam from space in 1910. <laughs> Uh, now, perhaps the, the biggest misunderstanding is how houses in wildfires actually get ignited. Uh, they don't get ignited by a wall of bright flames sweeping over everything. You know, if I was to light this piece of paper in a corner, you would see the flame go and, it, and it consume the whole piece of paper. And that's kind of what people think happens in a forest fire. But in a high wind situation, what happens is uh, firebrands, which are small embers, uh, get blown ahead of the fire and they land on things. And if something is dry, it will ignite and burn. And if something is uh, not dry, like a, a live green tree, uh, the, the embers are not going to catch it on fire, but they do, yeah. And uh, this is some video of what's called uh, an ember storm. Uh, when you get high wind like this, you basically can get embers being carried up to a mile ahead of the fire front. And it's practically impossible for the firefighters to stop the progress of the fire. Uh, and you can see all these little spot fires appearing from place to place. Wow. And then you get a house, this is actually a test chamber that they did to study this. You get a house and the embers actually build up in little piles around the bottom of the house. Uh, and they, they land in the gutter and this the big night leaves or they just simply uh, catch the edge of the wood. And then if your vents are not properly sealed with ember shields, then these little, uh, these little fire runs, these little embers, will just get inside the house and light the house on fire. And that's what happened with uh, uh, these, these houses here. They basically got caught in an ember storm, uh, the things got inside, and there's some wood framing inside them, they burned down to the ground. Uh, here we have melted aluminum. Uh, with the car frame itself is steel, it did not melt, this is aluminum. And you can actually melt aluminum. Uh, in a campfire, you can just stick it in an iron pan, stick it on top of a campfire, it will actually melt and you can pour it out exactly the same. Uh, the glass windows in the car uh, did not melt, they actually exploded because when you uh, heat up a glass uh, long enough, it will, uh, it will explode from thermal. The reason you didn't find it was because they all shattered in the fire. If you heat up a toilet, uh, it will shatter. Now, how do I know this? I spent a bit of time looking for people on YouTube who threw, bon threw a toilet on a bonfire and I couldn't find any. <laughs> so, very disappointed, I was sure I would be able to find you know, someone had thrown a toilet onto a bonfire and just to see what happened. So I told my wife I was going to go on the Craigslist and uh, buy a toilet. And actually, people keep toilets away because you know, they're refurbishing. I was going to get a toilet, um, bring, it to, bring it home and then stop on the bonfire. But I always said, ew! So, I didn't actually, uh, didn't actually do that. However, I have a friend who is a plumber, and he had some old toilets, and he got a piece of uh, one of the toilets that's a bit of a rim. You can see that stuck it on there, and very quickly that was actually speeded up. But it took a few minutes, and the toilet basically started to fracture, 
and then when you take it out, it's just fallen to pieces. So what's happened to the toilets is they're just, they're just shattered, they've fallen away. Beams of light, uh, these are all have explanations. This is actually a long exposure of a SpaceX rocket launch. <laughs> uh, this is, I think, essentially a lens flare. This is a, this is a dirty lens. I did a long explanation video of you just streak uh, the lens with your finger on an iPhone, it creates these streaks. This, this again is the same type of thing, it's, it's lens flare, the sun is somewhere up here, and it created this, this streak of light. So they all actually have explanations. Great price trees are just stump fire holes. Uh, when a, a tree stump uh, is left for about 10 years in the ground, it's completely rotted away, and then it dries out in the summer and it just burns away. This is something from a, a forest manual explaining how dangerous these things are because it creates these hazards. Trees are burnt from the inside because of a thing called heart rot. And everyone's heard about hollow trees, of course, and uh, you know, they hollow out because they get rotten in the middle. And you get this, this type of rot here, pocket rot, uh, which gets very, very dry in the summer, and then flames get inside and it just lights up like a chimney. So, again, okay, explanation here. Field on the left has been irrigated, field on the right has not oh. been irrigated. Oh. Uh, it's very obvious if you look at it, you know, it's a bunch of water there and it's a green crop, so there's just dry scrub land over there. But for some reason they couldn't pick it up uh, Garbage cans. And not particularly near a fire. Uh, again, it's not a wall of frame, it's not a wall of flame, it's isolated fires. There are uh, houses that are on fire. And here's a, an actual house fire that wasn't in the wildfire. And you can see that the, you know, this is huge fire here, and yet there's a uh, fireman just standing here, and the truck looks just fine. This is about the same distance away from the house as those mailboxes and those bins were. So, uh, this high speed rail map, uh, it kind of looks at first glance like it vaguely matches, but then you look at where the border is here's the border here, and here's the border over here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, completely different. And if I take this map and move it down here, uh, you can see it doesn't match at all. It's actually nowhere near Aww. any of the fires except for the ones uh, in Los Angeles, which you know, it really wasn't close to them either. All right, so in conclusion, uh, all of the evidence here has been debunked. And you can tell your friends these things, you can show them these things, and I encourage you to show them things rather than tell them things, show them videos, show them practical uh, explanations if you can. Um, Something else you can try to do is give them some broader context, encourage them to watch lots of old videos about old wildfires from the past. Uh, there are lots of things online about the things like the Bel Air fire and the, uh, uh, the fire in 1910. Uh, encourage them to watch new videos, there's lots of videos about fire science and fire safety. Uh, help them understand what, uh, what uh, how wildfires actually spread, uh, what people need to do to prevent wildfires, the things like you know, the, the end shields, things like that. Uh, you can even look at what the capabilities are of directed energy weapons. That's not going to work very well because they, they just think the government has some secret weapons. But if you tell, show them how long it actually takes for a directed energy weapon to start a fire, they might understand the scale of things. And I think it's tempting to laugh at theories like these. Uh, they seem like they're just ridiculous, crazy theories. You know, people laugh here because of some of the crazy things. Uh, that's fine because it's, it's just funny. But when you're talking to your friends, if you laugh at them, it's, it's not going to help. Uh, remember, from your friend's perspective, he thinks he's discovered, he or she thinks they've discovered some kind of uh, fundamental truth about the universe that they didn't know before. He thinks he's learned something new uh, that you don't know. So he thinks that you're the person who needs educating. So you get his perspective of you is going to be the same as your perspective does him, of him. So you really need to keep that in mind and avoid mocking him because that's going to uh, have a very negative effect. Because it would be the same thing as him mocking you. So uh, don't do it. <laughs> and finally, uh, as mentioned before, give it time. Don't expect immediate results for things like this. If someone is deep down the rabbit hole, it can take a long time to get out, but people do get out. Uh, this is something I talk about in my book. I interviewed a bunch of people who used to be deep conspiracy theorists and now no longer are. Uh, they did get out, so it took years. Uh, it can, you can help people out of their own hole and you can uh, stop people from falling in in the first place. It is possible to escape, and you can help. Thank you very much.
so, so big. It, 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 isn't there a level of self gratification attached to mocking? <laughs> uh, there is. I think that's a bit of a, a problem in that some people like debunking things because they like feeling superior to other people. Uh, and that, I think, sometimes sometimes works, but sometimes it's not very productive. And I think it's, it's better if we, yeah, if we try to respect people as much as possible. Obviously, some of the theories are ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, if someone is believing them, like, you don't go around uh, mocking your old grandmother just because she sincerely believes in Jesus. Uh, you still talk to her with respect, and I encourage you to do the same thing with people who believe in conspiracy theories. Okay, so we're not going to take questions right now from Nick because it's lunch time and he's going to have his books in the back. Holly, can you pull, pull them back up again so we can see where you guys are? Oh, back in the back. Go on that book.